Thanks so much, Raquel. You know, sometimes it's easy to, to read the Bible with the perspective of, well, that was then, and, and, but this is now. That was them, but this is me. That is, we read it with this assumed separation, that what we find in God's word no longer happens today. It certainly doesn't happen to someone like you or, or me. Intentionally or unintentionally, we put the people we read about on these spiritual pedestals. And we assume that we could, we could never do what they do. The book of Acts is, is filled with these types of people. It's filled with their amazing stories, incredible stories of, of faith, perseverance, Remarkable transformations of early Christ followers willingly enduring suffering and persecution while still sharing the gospel in boldness and power. And we say, that's great, but that's not me. I hope you've been paying attention because what we've seen and will continue to see throughout Acts is that the hero in Acts isn't Peter or Paul or any of the other disciples, it's the Holy Spirit working in and through them as they witness to Jesus. We also discover in an attentive reading of Scripture, we have a lot more in common with God's people than we might have thought. They had doubts and fears too. They had struggles and and conflict. There were instances where they messed up, but God's Spirit remained faithful. That's why Acts is such an important book. It doesn't just show us what the church could be like if we got our act together. More importantly, it shows us what God can do through the church, made up of imperfect people like you and I, when we allow His Spirit to do His work. And so today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 4. In the preceding chapter, chapter 3, Peter and John, they were going up to the temple for prayer. On their way there, they met a man lame from birth. That is, this man had not walked a single day in his entire life. And by the power in Jesus' name, he was healed. The sight of this man now leaping, singing, praising God in the temple courts drew a crowd. And the focus shifts from sign to speech as Peter delivered his second sermon. Now, Luke tells us at the beginning of chapter 4, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. I picture the temple authorities running in, just out of breath yelling, stop, stop, determined to make sure Peter and John didn't utter another word. I mean, as soon as they heard that there was a crowd gathered and Peter was at the center of it, all of the the lights, the bells, the whistles, it must have all switched on. Remember, it was only a short time before that Peter's preaching had taken a band of Christ followers from 120 to 2,000. Add to that Luke's remark that day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. They met daily in the temple court, so the disciples' growing influence would not have escaped the notice of the temple priests. With the report of a miraculous sign on top of that, And at this rate, it wouldn't be long before all Jerusalem would become Christ followers. The priests aren't identified here, but but the captain of the temple guard, uh, excuse me, the captain of the temple, or as some translations have, of the temple guard is essentially second only to the chief priest in power and influence. The temple guard was a, a police or security force. If you think back to Luke 22, it is the same temple guard that showed up to arrest Jesus in the garden. This fact surely wouldn't have been lost on Peter and John. 
Or perhaps that's exactly what the Jewish authorities were hoping for. Flex their muscle a little bit and remind the disciples what happened to their master. Temple guard or not, many of us would be terrified to do what Peter is doing, wouldn't we? And the, peer, the fear of public speaking is one of the most common fears we face. So let's just take that one out of it. Like for some of us, it doesn't even have to be a crowd we're witnessing to. It could just be one or two people. We'd still be uncomfortable. Because sharing our faith makes us uncomfortable. In the book Reluctant Witness, the author looked at a study done by Barna and, and Lutheran House Ministries. It showed over 70% of self-identified Christians have fewer than 10 conversations about their faith per year. 41% have two or less. The numbers are even more eye-opening when we realize those statistics include conversations with other Christians even conversations with a spouse or family members. As we saw in the first week in our series in, in Acts 1-8, Jesus calls us to be his witnesses. So why do we keep choosing to spiritually plead the fifth? Now, I don't mean to lay a guilt trip on you, but to challenge and equip you. Now, one of the things that the study found was that the more spiritual conversations we have, the easier they become. The easier be they become, the more likely we are to engage in such a, a way that it becomes natural. It becomes habit. So here's a homework assignment for you this week. If, if you're in the zero to two range and you drove with someone to church today, ask them on the way home, what did you experience God speaking to you? Do it, and you'll have increased your spiritual conversations for the year by at least 50%. Now, if you rode by yourself, it's a little tougher, uh, but try asking a friend or family member this week how you can pray for them. Like, if you're in the higher ranges of, of spiritual conversations, try asking a coworker or an acquaintance this week. Hey, how can, how can I pray for you? Or maybe put yourself out there, right? And and consider sharing with someone how, the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Now, here's another thing the study pointed out. 57% of church attenders think their church does a good job training people to share their faith. That's over half of attenders. On the other hand, I don't know many of us that would put a 57% grade on the refrigerator. Evidently, the church has work to do in raising up not merely believers but witnesses as we read through acts we should pay attention to the content of the disciples preaching and teaching it's probably not helpful to quote their sermons verbatim but it is helpful to see what they share and how they share it in differing contexts so what is the message of the gospel What's it about? One of the points that jumps out in, in Peter's message, preached back in chapter 3, was repentance. Peter says in verse 19, Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Which makes sense. Central to the invitation of the gospel is the call to repent. In Matthew, John the Baptist comes to prepare the way for the Lord and look at his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then in, in Matthew 4, the following chapter, Peter preaches, excuse me, Jesus preaches the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Same message. At the conclusion of Peter's first sermon, Luke tells us, the people were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance means to turn around, to change your direction, to change your mind. It entails the recognition that our ways are sinful, broken, and literally leading us to a dead end. It's not just feeling bad about our sins, but turning away from them. 
and turning toward God. See, we cannot enjoy the goodness, the the freedom of the gospel if we insist on continuing in the chains of our own sinfulness. It is radically different than than the I'm okay, you're okay message of our culture. Rather, it's the recognition that I am broken. I'm heading for destruction and in desperate need of course correction. As we share the good news with others, it's got to include this invitation to turn around as the message of the gospel is a call to repentance from sin. Now, repentance is a disruptive message. In the Apostles' Day, as it is in ours, people don't like it when we change, when we do things differently, particularly people in positions of power. The priests and the Sadducees liked the way things were because they profited from them. Large groups of people making course corrections and surrendering to the lordship of Jesus jeopardized that. Now, it wasn't just that Peter and John were calling people to repent. The authorities were much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. Now, this must have driven the Sadducees crazy. Luke will tell us later, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees, they believe all things, all these things. Now, the difference between the disciples' belief and that of the Pharisees is that while the Pharisees believe there would be a resurrection, Christians believe that in Christ the resurrection has begun. In John's gospel, Jesus puts the claim even more boldly, stating, I am the resurrection. Let's just camp out here for a moment. The resurrection has been kind of relegated in contemporary Christianity. Yet in Acts 1, it appears among the essentials. Right? When the disciples, they, they were praying about a replacement for Judas. This is the job description they gave for someone to become a witness with us to the resurrection. The resurrection was so central to the message of the early church that it's included in the second half of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Can you imagine a Christianity that failed to emphasize forgiveness of sins or everlasting life? Yet to our detriment, we regularly omit the resurrection of the body. Now, one of the reasons resurrection was so essential was that it confirmed Jesus' claims about himself. God vindicated Christ by raising him up. If Jesus was misguided, if he misled us, if his teaching was false, he would still be in the grave. And we would share his fate. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. Then those, also, then those also who have died in Christ have perished. But having been raised, he shows us that he's the Messiah that has been promised, that Scripture promised. He's the Messiah that we needed. Having taken our sins and conquered death, he opened the way to eternal life. Some might object, aren't there accounts of others in Scripture who returned from the dead? Jairus' daughter was raised. Lazarus was raised, Dorcas was raised, just to name a few. But their experience and Jesus's were of a different nature. With Jesus, it was more than resuscitation. He was, wasn't simply reanimated. He was changed. And Dorcas and the others could still get sick. They, they still died. Their flesh was still perishable. Jesus was different. He was raised imperishable. Now, he could walk through locked doors and yet still be physically touched. He still ate with the disciples, ate a meal with them. He wasn't immediately recognizable to them on the road to Emmaus. At the same time, he was still himself. And death had no hold on him. 
In the same 1 Corinthians passage, Paul refers to Jesus as the first fruits of those who have died. Now, first fruit is a harvest term. It, it refers to the produce that first comes up out of the ground. But it also anticipates there will be more. Christ, the first fruits, Paul says, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. As he was raised in him, we too will be raised, and we know we will be like him. We don't know much about what our resurrected bodies will, will be like, but we do know this. Upon resurrection, Jesus was neither disembodied spirit nor a ghost. Paul tells us, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Now spiritual, this might confuse some of you, spiritual doesn't mean non-material here. Rather, it's suggesting something greater than these bodies we have that tire, wear out, and break down. The message of the resurrection is that our hope is grounded in this historical event that Christ rose from the grave and God will do in us what he has already done in Christ. Not only that, the process has already started. In Christ, God has begun the, prom the process of putting the cosmos marred by sin back together. He's already in the process of setting everything to right. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of, his great, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What is, what's Paul saying? The resurrection is an indication of the great love with which God has loved us. It's an expression of rich mercy, his immeasurable grace and kindness towards us. And it's already happened. We were dead through our transgressions, but we have been raised up. Somehow, right now, in some manner of speaking, we are already seated with him in the heavenly places. Reflect on that for a moment. Doesn't that give you confidence for the day today? Like, why all the stress? Why? Why do I allow sin and temptation and fear to rule me? Why does my past dominate me? I am raised up. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Paul says it this way in Colossians. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have, remember that's past tense, have, not will, you have died and your life is hidden. It's already happened, it's hidden with Christ in God. When God who is your life, uh, when Christ who is your life is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. In him, we've already died and risen. I know this is blowing some of your minds. So often we miss this gospel message. We've embraced a message of forgiveness in Jesus' name, but one without the resurrection life that he intends. You are not just a forgiven person. You are a new person. Not someday, but today. Right now. Because of what Christ did on the cross and in the empty tomb, we can have not just hope, but confidence. 
And as we share this gospel with others, we share a message of resurrection life. That Jesus rose from the grave. He's begun the process of renewing everything. And that through our faith in him, he'll do that for us, in us, as he shares his resurrection life with us. This is what it means for Paul to preach about the resurrection. It was the message of the early church and a message proclaimed with power. When I say the gospel has power, I mean something different than if we were to remark that that was a powerful movie or, oh, that was a powerful book. When we say something is powerful, when we may say something is powerful when we are moved by it. It may even move us to make a significant change in our life. However, that is not the gospel. The gospel is not merely powerfully compelling or powerfully motivating. It is a power. Paul tells us it is the power of God. Back to Acts 1.8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus doesn't equip them with public speaking classes. He doesn't send them to Toastmasters. He sends his Holy Spirit, and it is a spirit of power. Thus, the change that comes about in our lives, the change that comes from the gospel is is not due to our own effort, but to the power inherent in the gospel. And it's on display in Acts 4.4. Despite hauling Peter and John off to prison for the night, the religious authorities, they could do nothing, nothing at all to to contain the power of the gospel. Luke tells us, but many of those who heard the word believed and they numbered about 5,000. That's power, isn't it? The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family. This is a who's who of the first century Jewish religious elite. Along with 71 elders, this group made up the Sanhedrin. All of the status, the influence, the earthly power in Judah was on their side. When they made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or what name do you do this? When you read between the lines, they're asking, who do you think you are? Or what gives you the right? Which is a ridiculous question, isn't it? Because a man who had been lame since birth had been healed and was standing right before their very eyes. Their question also seems to bear the accusation, we didn't give you permission to do this. How dare you heal someone without consulting us? There are strong echoes here to the confrontation between Jesus and the Jewish authorities when they asked him the very same question about cleansing the temple. Throughout the book of Acts, we'll see that the disciples have zero, zero, zero interest or aspiration towards the kind of earthly power exercised by the Sanhedrin. At no point are they concerned or covetous of the power of priests and kings. They know you guys are a dime a dozen. Christians today in America should take note. The more we trust, actually put our trust in in the gospel as the power to transform and bring renewal, the less, the less we will look to earthly powers to do so. If you are looking to earthly powers to renew and transform this world, it is because you do not trust the power of the gospel. 
If you're putting your, if you're fearful of the things that are happening in this world, fearful of the things that are happening in our culture, I'm sorry, I will tell it's because you don't trust the gospel. You don't believe it has enough power. You can talk to me after the service, but I'm telling you, it's it. If we trust in the power of the gospel to transform and bring renewal, as we see the disciples, we don't chase after power in this world. It's as simple as that. That wasn't in my notes, but you guys get that one for free. (laughs) Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man was, was healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. What we encounter here in Peter's response is a fulfillment of promise on a number of levels. The first is something Jesus said back in Luke 12. There Jesus told his disciples, when, you bring, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or, or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. To, to ensure we don't miss the illusion, Luke pointedly remarks, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit before delivering his response. Let's just take a moment to reflect on this. Not only does the Spirit give us the power to share the gospel, the very power of God, as as we see in Luke and its fulfillment in Acts, we can also depend on that same Spirit to give shape to our proclamation. In other words, we are equipped, empowered, and accompanied for the task to which we've been called. The second promise fulfilled here is is the quotation from Psalm 118. That is what Peter is referring to there, that Jesus was the cornerstone. We see that in Psalms. The reference for that came directly from Jesus. He said that himself. Peter will use it again in his first letter. Now, what is he doing with this? He's showing us that the good news regarding Jesus is not something new or accidental. But this is the fulfillment of God's promise. Even their rejection of it was anticipated. This had all been prophesied long ago and it comes to pass in Jesus. As it says in Corinthians, for in him every one of God's promises is a yes. When we are sharing the good news with others, we are sharing a message of promise. It is a promise fulfilled. Our God is a promise keeping God and he's faithful to do what he said. And the greatest evidence of this is in Jesus, the promised Messiah. The last point in Peter's message certainly isn't a popular one in our day. But it is the simplest. It's maybe the most necessary. Peter concludes there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The good news that we have to share is not about being a part of the right church or political party or holding the right views on certain cultural issues. The gospel is about Jesus. And salvation is found exclusively in Jesus' name. Repentance, resurrection, life, power, and promise are found only in Jesus. Only as we bow our knee and surrender to his lordship. As we recognize he is our king of of kings and, and lord of lords. There are no other roads to salvation. No other religions will get us there. Neither any work of our own to earn it. He's the way and the truth and the life. 
despite what our pluralistic, relativistic culture will tell us about the insensitivity of our message, it's a message that cannot be altered, it cannot be watered down, and it's one we cannot keep quiet about. Let's close with, with Paul's words in Romans. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Church, would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we thank you, we praise you, we will praise you in and all, through all eternity for the gift of the gospel, for the good news that you offer us. While we were dead in our transgressions, you, you offered us resurrection life. You, you, gave, you put your power within us to, to turn around and turn back to you. We thank you that you, are, that you are transforming our life even now as you transform all creation. We also thank you for the, the gift of this gospel, not just for the, the way it's changed our lives, but for the way you've called us to, to proclaim it. For the gift of your Holy Spirit to empower, equip, and accompany us as we proclaim this good news to the world that you love. Lord, I pray that, that you would stir in us a longing to share, that you would stir in us a broken heart for this community and that it, this community in us would, would find those of, of beautiful feet. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.